Hello, HIWD 555 students. My name is Ronald Picciarelli, and tonight in my brief lecture, I'm going to be talking about the French campaign of 1940, and specifically, we're going to talk about the historiography of the 1940 campaign from Germany into France and overrunning France. Our learning goals for tonight are going to be applying critical reading and thinking skills to historical inquiry, and also the ability to formulate critically diverse interpretations regarding controversies of World War II. Now, the 1940 French Blitzkrieg campaign um, was written about almost immediately um, after or during the war, I should say. Um, here's uh, Theodore Draper's book called The Six Weeks War, which was written in 1944. And uh, Theodore Draper comes to some very unusual conclusions in that uh, he's not really sure why the country of Belgium would have chosen neutrality before the war instead of a, a military alliance with France, or he also says that the Maginot Line was never completed. Um, he does come to some other conclusions, which uh, we get into as we go through the decades that are really right on, where uh, British general Lord Gort um, didn't really uh, counterattack uh, very well. Things were very uncoordinated in the British Expeditionary Force. He talks about the French forces kind of being outclassed by the Germans, which we'll see later. You know, that's not necessarily right on. Um, after the war, um, American audiences were heavily influenced by uh, these German generals that came out with their memoirs about World War II. We have uh, Heinz Guderian's Panzer Leader, where he talks about the German forces um, going into France, and uh, <clears throat> basically there was like a hot knife ripping through butter. The same way with uh, Eric von Manstein, um, who wrote Lost Victories. Um, Manstein was the, I, was the person that sold the idea for the German forces to go through the Ardennes instead of in northern Belgium, where the British and the French forces were waiting for them. And uh, Manstein um, also talks about uh, the 1940 campaign as being uh, basically these German forces were superior in every aspect, and it was like the hot knife going through butter. Um, historiography of this of this campaign gets into you know, people's their 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 memoirs. You know, you look at them, and there's a lot of egos that are attached to them. And some people are just uh, uh, downright misleading, and we'll see that in various sources. <clears throat> we have Franz Halder, who is uh, uh, was the chief of uh, the German staff, and um, <clears throat> he later came to the United States, and uh, he was employed by the uh, U.S. Army to give the U.S. Army advice about the Russian forces during the Cold War, about how best the U.S. Army could prepare against possible attacks uh, against the Russians, and what uh, Franz Halder had to say was, you know, taken as, like, gospel. Oh, you know, he was in charge of the German army. It must be true. Well, as we see later on, that he, um, he he actually wrote a lot of things that were not quite true. He got into the uh, the aspects, just like uh, Manstein and Guderian, that the French campaign was like a you know hot knife going through butter. The French were just totally outclassed, unprepared, um, it, and, and it was a real pushover campaign. Um, so those were those those guys wrote in the nineteen fifties. Also, um, some other British authors, which heavily influenced Americans, also wrote in the nineteen fifties too. We have uh, <clears throat> Winston Churchill's their finest hour. Winston Churchill was a major participant in the in World War Two and wrote a series of books about. Um, his experiences, and he writes that he tried to bolster up the, the French, but what happened was the French 
um, um, leaders of the government panicked and that sent shockwaves through the rest of the, the French army because the leaders of the government were panicking. In fact, one of them, uh, Paul Renaud, one of the leaders of the French government, called Winston Churchill one morning and said, the Germans have broken through at Sedan. All is lost. The, the entire nation is lost. And Winston Churchill tried to calm him down and uh, talk to him about reserves. And uh, this uh, um, French politician was just in a, in a panic and it never got any better after that. Um, also, um, British authors, uh, this uh, A.J.P. Taylor wrote in uh, 19, uh, 60, 62, 63, um, The Origins of the Second World War. And here we have a lot of um, mentalities that uh, are, are in like the, the mindset of when, when people think back or what, what little they, they may know about the 1930s or what was going on at that time politically. We have uh, the uh, British that are in like an appeasement mindset where they're willing to give in almost anything to avoid war. You know, that, that basically comes from uh, Taylor. Um, the French are in a defensive mindset. You know, they're hide behind the Maginot Line, they have a tiny army, and all that. That comes from Taylor. And also, the extremely aggressive Nazis um, that are willing to try almost anything to uh, overrun countries, um, that kind of mindset, you know, it was heavily influenced by, by Taylor also. Later on, in the uh, um, mid-1960s, we have uh, Alastair Horn, who wrote To Lose a Battle, which was about the French campaign, obviously. And uh, he, he writes in there that uh, the French just, you know, never really stood a chance against the Nazis. You know, it was one defeat after another defeat. And by uh, mid-June 1940, everything was, was, was lost. Now... We also uh, are fortunate enough to look at the French sources for what happened in 1940. And uh, we've got the complete war mem memoirs of Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle was a general in the, in the 1940 campaign. And what he has to say is pretty important. Charles de Gaulle says that when he was leading his French armored forces, um, he could have, you know, stopped the Nazis and, you know, broken through this uh, um, Nazi uh, uh, corridor that they had going to the sea, which cut off all their French, uh, all the British and French forces north of there, and they had to evacuate at Dunkirk. He said he could have broken through that, but you know it, it, there weren't any reserves, and no one would support him, and you know everything would have been better if we just listened to him. You know, so we have, you know, big ego going here, too, where, you know, we could have saved the day if it wasn't for lack of reserves and, you know, the politicians, other generals didn't listen to them and whatnot. And then we have the actual commander of the French forces, uh, Maxime Weygand, who was called in um, uh, around the time of Dunkirk and to try and save the French army and you know he did the best he could he taught and his book is called a recall to service where he was an old man and in 1940 and he was uh, you know serving out a couple of years before he re retired and he was recalled back into service and what he has to say is pretty important where he did his best and he just you know couldn't stop the Germans after after the best French soldiers and equipment was was lost in northern Belgium and then we have just you know average French uh, soldiers you know Marc Bloch uh, famous book strange defeat where he talks about uh, you know his his best quote here is is that uh, from the beginning to the end of the war the metronome at headquarters were always set at too slow a speed and he talks about just the uh, the reactions of the French generals were just too slow and uh, this they were outclassed by the by the Nazis the Nazi victory was was so quick and then we have uh, Antoine Saint Uxbury Flight to Arras and St. Uxbury um, also wrote a children's book, The Little Prince, and uh, he was a reconnaissance plane pilot 
at the time. And he writes in, in his book that uh, the, the French Air Force put all their money into fighters and bombers, what few that ever made it into combat, and they only had 50 reconnaissance planes for the entire French army. And most of them were shot down right away, and uh, he was in one of the last ones, and he went on a very dangerous miss mission to um, assess the, the Germans that, that had broken through near near Arras in, in, in France. And, uh, he wrote, and he writes about the book. It's a lot of its poetry and stuff, but it's pretty interesting what he's got to say about the, the lack of reconnaissance planes in the French army. And then we have the French politician Paul Renou, who uh, was I was running the government of France, head of the government of France, and he writes his book in the thick of the fight, where he says he's in the thick of the fight, but he, he, he actually is the French politician who uh, called up uh, Winston Churchill in the panic and says, oh, the Germans have broken through at Sedan, all is lost, ah! And um, he has his version of it in here, which is very similar to what, what Winston Churchill said, but this uh, uh, French politician is a pretty slippery guy, and uh, even though he says he's in the thick of the fight, he arranges things behind the scenes, and he gets Maxime Weygand to come in and take some of the blame for the loss of, of the, the French nation, and then he gets uh, uh, Henri Pétain to come in, and Henri Pétain is actually the guy who signs the armistice with the Germans, and uh, uh, Paul Reynaud is actually out of the government by, by that time and he makes others take the blame for his mistakes. Um, and then we, we, we come to uh, some of the literature about the Maginot Line. And the Maginot Line is known as a great white elephant in military history. And here's some of the information about it. This was a picture of the Maginot Line that was published in the New York Times. And as you can see, it looks more of, a, of, of, of like a wall. And that's the impression the public got. And it's even the impression that, that are in some books, too. Here's uh, Vivian Rose, the Great Wall of France. And uh, the... Uh, more modern sources, you know, don't don't talk about the Maginot Line as, as as like the Great Wall of China, the Great Wall of France kind of thing. It was more like uh, in in this book, uh, William Alcorn talks about it, and, and he investigates it and takes a lot of pictures, and he says it's more like it was it was meant to just slow down the Germans, not completely stop them like the Great Wall of China. And it was like like the fingers of a hand that if the Germans were to get through um, some of the French fortifications, the French field army would be able to move up and stop the Germans before they could get into the interior of France. And also we start to, to see that in more modern literature and uh, studies about the, the fall of France. Here's Arming Against Hitler by e Eugenia Kiesling. Excellent book talking about what the French generals had in mind when they were rearming in the 1930s and what the Maginot Line was really all about. That it was just meant to slow down the Germans, not to be this great wall that, that was going to separate them. and. That's that's not the case at all, really. And then uh, uh, more modern studies um, in the last few years, you know, Case Red uh, by uh, Forsyth. Um, he talks about um, you know the what what the Germans had in mind and what the French had in mind were two different, were very different, diverging. Um, thought, military thought about what the campaign was supposed to be like, what a future war was supposed to be, be like. The French had ideas like uh, um, Philip Nord um, defending the, the France 1940, defending the Republic. He talks about um, the French believed in armored warfare too, but they were just, they were, they were planning on having the uh, French field army mobilize with uh, mass conscription in France and then be able to fight back, push back the Germans once they got through. So um, that's those are some of the um, ideas and the historiography of the fall of France. I hope you enjoyed this brief lecture. We'll talk to you soon.